Tekla enters, goes straight for him, and kisses him. She is friendly, frank, gay, and attractive. Tekla. Hello, little brother. How are you? Adolf is almost won over by her manner and speaks reluctantly as if joking. What mischief have you been up to that makes you come and kiss me like that? I'll tell you. I've spent a frightful lot of money. Did you have a good time, then? Yes, very. But not at that old creche meeting. That was just shit, as the Danes would say. But how has my little brother amused himself while Squirrel was away? Tekla's eyes roam around the room as if she's looking for someone or suspecting something. I've been bored stiff. Didn't anyone come to keep company? No, uh, I've been quite alone. Tekla, watching him as she sits down on the sofa. Who has been sitting here? There? Nobody. That's odd. The sofa's still warm and there's a hollow that seems to have been made by an elbow. Have you had some lady friends? You know I haven't. But you're blushing. Little brother, I believe you're telling fibs. Come over here and tell Squirrel what's on your conscience. She draws him to her. He sinks down with his head on her knees. Adolf smiling. You're a devil. Did you know that? No, I don't know anything about myself. I see. You never give a thought to your own reactions. Tekla, warily. On the contrary, I never think about anything but myself. I'm a terrible egoist. You're very philosophical all of a sudden. Put your hand on my forehead. Have you been having another brainstorm? Poor head. Let me see what I can do. Kisses his forehead. There. Is it better now? Yes. It's better now. Well, tell me, how have you been amusing yourself? Have you painted anything? No, I've... I've done with painting. What? Done with painting? Yes, but don't nag me about it. It's not my fault. I can't paint anymore. But what will you do, then? I'm going to be a sculptor. Oh, Lord, another whole lot of new ideas. Yes, but don't be cross. Take take a look at that figure over there. Tekla uncovers the wax figure. Well, I never... Who is it supposed to be? Guess. Is it meant to be Squirrel? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Isn't it a good likeness? How can I tell when it hasn't got a face? Yes, but there's so much else. Beautiful. Tekla, caressing his cheek. Hold your tongue, or I'll kiss you. Adolf, backing. Now, now. Somebody might come in. What do I care? Mayn't I kiss my own husband, then? Surely that's my legal right. Yes, but... Do you know what... Here, in the hotel, they don't believe we're married, because we kiss so often. And the fact that we quarrel sometimes makes no difference. Lovers are known to do that, too. Tekla. Yes, but why should we quarrel? Why can't you always be as nice as you are now? Tell me, don't you want us to be happy? Oh, uh, I do, but what is all this business, anyhow? Who has put it into your head that you're not going to be painting anymore? Who? You're always suspecting there's someone behind me in my my thoughts. You're jealous. Yes, I am. I'm afraid someone may come and take you away from me. You're afraid of that? When you know no woman can cut you out, and that I, I can't live without you? It's not a woman I'm afraid of. But your friends who put ideas into your head. Adolf, looking at her searchingly. You really are frightened. What frightens you? Someone has been here. Who has been here? Don't you like me to look at you? Not like that. That's not how you usually look at me. How was I looking at you then? Under your lids. And under yours. Yes, I... I want to see what's behind them. Look as much as you like. There's nothing to hide. But 
You're talking in a different way, too. You're philosophizing. Why? Going up to him threateningly. Who has been here? Only my doctor. Your doctor? Who's that? The doctor from Stromstad. What's his name? Sjorberg. What did he say? He said, well, among other things, he said that I was on the brink of epilepsy. Among other things? What else did he say? Well, something very upsetting. Tell me. He said that we were not to live together as man and wife for a time. Did he then? I can well believe it. They want to separate us. I have noticed that for a long time. You can't have noticed what's never happened. Haven't I, though? How can you see what doesn't exist? Or is your imagination so distraught by fear that you see what has never existed? What is it you are so afraid of? That I shall borrow someone else's eyes so as to see you as you are instead of as you appear to be? Keep your fancies in check, Adolf. They come from the beast in the human soul. Wherever did you learn that? From those innocent youths in the boat? Eh? Tekla, without losing her composure. Well, as a matter of fact, there is a lot to be learned from the youth. I think you're beginning to be infatuated by youth. I always have been. That's why I fell in love with you. Do you mind? No, but I'd rather be the only one. My heart is so big, you see, little brother, that there's room in it for many more than you. Little brother doesn't want any other brothers. Come to Squirrel, then, and get your hair pulled for being so jealous. No, envious is the word. Two knocks are heard from Gustav's room. No, I, I don't want to fool now. I want to talk seriously. Tekla, as if talking to a baby. Oh, Jesus, does he want to talk seriously, then? It's frightful how serious he's grown. She takes his face in her hands and kisses him. Now just a little smile. Adolf unwillingly smiles. There. You devilish woman. I really believe you can cast spells. You see? So don't start any trouble or I'll spirit you away. Adolf, rising. Tekla, will you pose a moment for me, in profile, so I can put the face on your figure? Hm? Of course I will. She turns her head so that he can see her profile. He gazes at her and pretends to model. Don't think about me now. Think about... somebody else. I'll think about my latest conquest. The chaste youth? Exactly. He had such a sweet little mustache and cheeks like a peach. They were so small and rosy one wanted to bite them. Adolf, grimly. Keep that expression on your face. What expression? A cynical, brazen one I have never seen before. Tekla, making a face. Like this? Mm. Yes, like that. Rises. Do you know how Bret Hart describes an adulteress? Tekla, smiling. No. I have never read Bret... whatever you call him. As a pallid creature who... never blushes. Never. But when she meets her lover, she's bound to blush though her husband and Mr. Brett aren't there to see it. Are you sure? Tekla, as before. Of course. As the husband is incapable of bringing the blood to her head. He can't ever see that charming spectacle. Tekla, you little ninny. Tekla! You should call me your squirrel. Then I'd blush beautifully for you. Don't you want me to? 
I'm so furious with you, you little monster. I could... I could bite you. Come and bite me, then. Come on. She stretches out her arms to him. Adolf takes her in his arms and kisses her. Yes, I will, I will bite you to death. Tekla, teasing him. Now, now, somebody might come in. What do I care? What do I care about anything in the world so long as I've got you? And if you hadn't got me anymore? Then I should die. But you're not afraid of what's happening because I'm so old no one else would have me. Oh, Tekla, you have not forgotten those words of mine. But, but I take them all back. Can you explain why you're so jealous and yet at the same time so confident? No. I, I, I can't explain anything. But it's possible the thought that another man once possessed you still rankles in me. Sometimes it seems to me that our love is n nothing but a fiction, a self-defense, a passion held to as a matter of honor. But there's nothing I would hate more than for him to know I'm not happy. Oh, though I've never seen him, the, m the mere thought of somebody waiting for my downfall obsesses me. Somebody who's raining curses on my head every day of the year and would laugh his head off at my... at my ruin. The mere idea of that haunts me, drives me to you, fascinates me, cripples me. Do you think I'd allow him that satisfaction? Do you think I want to make his prophecy come true? I don't want to think so. Then why don't you keep calm? You go on upsetting me with your coquettishness. Why did you play these tricks? They're not tricks. I want to be liked, that's all. But only by men? Of course. A woman's really never liked by other women you know. Tell me, have you heard from him recently? Not for the last six months. Do you ever think about him? No. When our child died, there was no further link between us. And you haven't seen him anywhere? No. He's said to be living somewhere on the West Coast. But why are you worrying about all this now? I don't know. But these days, while I've been alone, I found myself thinking how he must have felt when he was left alone that time. I believe you have a bad conscience. I have. I suppose you feel like a thief. Pretty nearly. That's beautiful. Men can steal women just as children and chickens are stolen. So you only think of me as one of his goods and chattels. Thank you very much. No, uh, I think of you as his wife. And, and that's more than property. It's something that can't be replaced. Of course it can't. If you were to hear he had married again, all those silly ideas would go out of your head. After all, haven't you replaced him in my life? Have I? And did you love him once? I most certainly did. And then? I got tired of him. Supposing you were to get tired of me too. <laughs> I shan't do that. Supposing somebody else came along who had the qualities you want in a man now, then you'd give me up. No. Supposing he captivated you, so you couldn't give him up, then you'd leave me. Of course, no, that's not true. Surely you, you couldn't love two men at the same time. Yes. Why not? I don't understand. Things can be, even though you don't understand them. All people are not made alike, you know. Now I begin to see. No, really? Adolf seems to be struggling with some memory he cannot grasp. Tekla, you know your frankness is beginning to trouble me. But that used to be the virtue you put highest. And you taught it to me. Yes, but... It seems to me you're hiding something now between your 
frankness. That's the new tactics you see. I don't know why, but I'm beginning to dislike this place. If you don't mind, we'll go home this evening. What sort of whim is this? I've only just arrived. I don't want to start on another journey. But I do. What's it got to do with me what you want? You can go. I I command you to come with me by the next boat. Command me. What sort of talk is that? Do you realize that you are my wife? Do you realize that you are my husband? Yes. There's a difference between the one and the other. So that's the line you're taking. You have never loved me. Haven't I? No. For to love is to give. To love as a man is to give. But to love as a woman is to take. And I have given, given, given. Oh, what have you given? Everything. (laughs) That's a lot. And if it's so, then I've taken it. Are you giving me the bills for your gifts now? And if I have taken them, that's a proof that I have loved you. A woman only takes gifts from her lover. Her lover, yes. You used the right word. I have been your lover, but never your husband. Well, isn't that much pleasanter to escape being the chaperone? But if you're not satisfied with that position, you can take yourself off. I don't want a husband. No. I've noticed that. And lately when I've watched you sneaking away from me like a thief and making friends on your own among whom you could flaunt my feathers and glitter with my jewels, I've tried to remind you of your debt. Then I at once became the unwelcomed creditor whom one only wants to get rid of. You wanted to repudiate your notes of hand, and so as not to increase your debt to me, you stopped pillaging my treasure chest and started on other people's. I became your husband without wanting to be, and then you began to hate me. But now, as I mayn't be your lover, I am going to be your husband, whether you want it or not. My sweet idiot. Don't talk such nonsense. You know, it's risky to go around thinking everyone's an idiot but yourself. And I'm beginning to suspect that he, your former husband, possibly wasn't such an idiot after all. Oh God, I believe you're beginning to sympathize with him. A little bit. Yes. Well, I never. Perhaps you would like to make his acquaintance and have a heart to heart. What a beautiful picture. But I'm beginning to be rather drawn to him too, as I'm tired of playing nursemaid. He was at least a man, although he had the disadvantage of being my husband. Look here, don't talk so loud. People will hear us. What does it matter if they take us for a married couple? So now you're beginning to be infatuated by virile men and chaste youths all at the same time? As you see, my infatuations haven't got any limits. My heart is open to everybody and everything, big and small, beautiful and ugly, young and old. I love the whole world. Do you know what that means? No, I don't know anything. I only feel. It means that you are getting old. (laughs) There you go again. Take care. Take care of yourself. What of? Adolf, picking up one of his tools. This knife. You shouldn't play with such dangerous things, young brother. I'm not playing now. Oh. This is serious, is it? Dead serious. Then I'll show you that you're under a delusion. That's to say that you'll never be able to see it. You'll never know it, but the whole rest of the world will know it, everyone but you. You will suspect it. You will have a sense of it, and you will never have another moment's peace. You will feel that you're ridiculous, that you're deceived, but you will never have any proof of it. A married man never does have that. That's what you'll find out. You hate me, then? No, I don't. And I don't believe I ever shall. But that, of course, is because you are a child. Now. Yes. But do you understand how it was when the storm broke over us? Then you would lie crying like a small baby. Then you would have to sit on my lap while I kissed your eyes to sleep. It was I who was the nurse then. I had to see that you didn't go out without doing your hair. Had to send your shoes to the cobbler and see that there was food to cook. 
I had to sit by your side and hold your hand for hours at a time. You were frightened, frightened of the whole world because you didn't have a single friend left and you were crushed by public opinion. I had to talk courage into you until my mouth was dry and my head ached. I had to imagine I was strong and force myself to believe in the future. At last I managed to bring you back to life, although you seemed half dead. Then you admired me. Then I was the man, not the athlete you had left, but the man of willpower. The mesmerist who instilled new energy into your flabby muscles and charged your empty brain with new electricity. And then I gave you back your reputation, provided you with new friends, surrounded you with a little court of people whom I tricked out of their friendliness to me into admiring you. I set you over me in my house, and then I painted my most beautiful pictures rose-red and osier blue against golden backgrounds, and there wasn't one exhibition where you did not hold the place of honor. Sometimes you were St. Cecilia, sometimes Mary Stuart, Karen Mann's daughter, or Eva Bray. I made everyone interested in you and compelled the booing mob to see you with my own infatuated vision. I plagued people with your personality and forced you on them till you had won their all-important good opinion and could stand in your own feet. But by the time you could do that, my strength was finished and I collapsed from exhaustion. In lifting you up, I have overstrained myself. I was taken ill, and my illness infuriated you, coming now when at last life had begun to smile on you. Sometimes it seems to me you had a secret longing to be rid of your creditor and witness. Your love begins to take on the character of an overbearing sister's, and for want of a better, I have to learn the new part of a little brother. Your tenderness remains. It even increases, but it is... It has in it a suggestion of pity that's not far from contempt, and which changes into open scorn when my talent wanes and your sun rises. But somehow your fountain of inspiration seems to dry up when mine can no longer replenish it, or rather, when you want to show that you don't draw on mine. And so both of us sink. And then you have to have somebody to blame. Somebody new, for you are weak and can never shoulder your own guilt. So I became the scapegoat to be sacrificed alive. But when you cut my sinews, you didn't realize you were also crippling yourself. For the years had joined us as twins. You were an offshoot of my tree, but you tried to make your shoot grow before it had any roots. That's why you couldn't develop on your own, and my tree couldn't spare its vital branch, so both of them died. What you mean to say by all this is that you wrote my books. No, that's what you mean to say, so as to prove me a liar. I don't express myself as crudely as you do, and I have talked for these five minutes so as to get in all the half-tones and nuances and variations, but your barrel organ has only one note. Yes. Yes, but the gist of it all is that you wrote my books. There isn't any gist. You can't reduce a chord to a single note. You can't express a very life in a single number. I didn't say anything so crude as I wrote your books. But that's what you meant. That's not what I meant, but the sum of it. There can't be a sum if you don't add things up. If you divide and the figure doesn't go into one another evenly, you get a quotient which is a long, unending decimal fraction. I haven't added it up, no. But I can add it up. No doubt you can. But I haven't. But you wanted to. No. No, no, no. Don't talk to me anymore. I shall have an attack. Be be quiet, go away. You destroy my brain with your clumsy pincers. You you claw my thoughts and tear them to pieces. Adolf seems almost to lose consciousness and sits staring in front of him, rolling his thumbs. Tekla, tenderly. What is it, Adolf? Are you ill? 
he motions her away. Adolf. He shakes his head. Adolf! Yes. Don't you think you were unfair just now? Yes. Yes, 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 I admit it. And do you apologize? Yes. Yes, yes, I apologize. If only you won't talk to me. Then kiss my hand. Adolf, kissing her hand. I'll kiss your hand. If only you won't talk to me. And now go out and get some fresh air before dinner. I certainly need it. Rises. And then we'll pack and go. No. Why not? There must be some reason. I've promised to go to a concert tonight. That's the reason. So that's it. That's it. I've promised to be there and promised. I expect you only said you might go. That doesn't stop you from saying now that you can't. No, unlike you, I keep my word. One can keep one's promise without having to stand by every casual word one says. Perhaps someone made you promise to go. Yes. Even so, you can be released from your promise as your husband is ill. No, I don't want to be. And you aren't so ill that you can't come with me. Why do you always want to have me with you? Do you feel more at ease then? I don't know what you mean. That's what you always say when you know I mean something you don't like. Really? What is it I'd like to know now? Stop it, will you? Don't start that again. Goodbye for this moment. And think what you are doing. Exit Adolf by the door to the veranda, turning to the right. Tekla is left alone. After a moment, Gustav enters and goes straight to the table, as if looking for a newspaper. He pretends not to see Tekla. She is agitated but controls herself. Is it you? It is I. Please excuse me. How did you get here? By land. But I'm not going to stay. I do stay. Well, it's been a long time. Yes. A long time. You've changed a lot. And you are as charming as ever. And even younger. But you must excuse me. I am not going to spoil your happiness with my presence. If I had known you would be here, I should never... If you don't think it's improper, I should like you to stay. There's nothing against it from my point of view. But I'm afraid whatever I say is bound to offend you. Sit down for a moment. You won't offend me. You have that rare quality. You always had it of tact and courtesy. You flatter me. But one can't expect your husband to regard my qualities so leniently. As a matter of fact, he was expressing his sympathy for you just now. Oh? Well, of course, everything vanishes in time. Like one's name cut in a tree. Even hatred can't stay in one's mind forever. He has never disliked you. How could he when he's never seen you? And as for me, I've... And as for me, I've always dreamt of seeing you two once as friends. Or at least of seeing you meet once in my presence, shake hands and part. And it has been my secret desire to see if she whom I loved better than my life was in truly good hands. I have certainly heard good accounts of him and I know his work well. But even so, I should have liked, before I grew old, to take his hand and look into his eyes and beg him to guard the treasure Providence has put into his keeping. 
At the same time, I should have liked to put an end to the instinctive hatred there was bound between us, and give my soul some peace and humility to live by for the rest of my sorrowful days. You have spoken my very thoughts. You have understood me. Thank you for that. Oh, I am a poor man. I was too insignificant ever to put you in the shade. The monotony of my life, the drudgery of my work, and the narrowness of my horizon were not for your adventurous spirit. I realized that, but you, who have studied the human soul so deeply, must realize what it cost me to confess this to myself. It is noble. It is great to be able to acknowledge one's own weakness. And not everyone is capable of it. But yours was always an honest, faithful, trustworthy nature which I respected. Although, I wasn't like that then. Not at that time, but suffering purifies one, sorrow ennobles one, <laughs> and I have suffered. Poor Gustav. Can you forgive me? Tell me, can you? Forgive you? What are you saying? Is it for me to ask your forgiveness? Why, I believe we're both crying. At our age. Our age. Ah, uh, yes, I am old. But you get younger and younger. Do you think so? And you know how to dress. I learned that from you. Don't you remember how you found the best colors for me? No. Yes. Don't you remember? I even remember a time when you were cross with me if I didn't wear some touch of scarlet. I wasn't cross. I was never cross with you. Oh, yes, you were. When you tried to teach me how to think. Don't you remember that? I couldn't do it at all. Of course you could think. Everyone can do that. And now you are quite intelligent. In your writing, at least. Tekla is embarrassed and rushes on with the conversation. It's delightful to see you again anyway, dear Gustav. Especially in such a peaceful way. Well, I never was exactly rowdy. You always had a peaceful time with me. Yes, a, a bit too peaceful. Oh? But you see, that's how I thought you wanted me to be. That's how it seemed when we were engaged. One doesn't know what one wants. Besides, I've been told by Mama to make a good impression on you. Well, you live in a world now. The artistic life is always dazzling, and your husband doesn't seem to be exactly lethargic. One can have too much of a good thing, you know. Gustav, once again changing his tactics. I say, I do believe you are still wearing my earrings. Tekla, embarrassed. Well, why shouldn't I? We've never quarreled, so I thought I might wear them as a token. As a reminder that we were not enemies. Besides, you know, it's impossible to get earrings like this nowadays. She takes one off. That's all very well, but what does your husband say about that? Why should I care what he says? Don't you care? But you do him wrong by that. It could make him ridiculous. Tekla quickly as if to herself. Is that already? She has difficulty putting her earring on again. Gustav rises. Perhaps you'll let me help you. Thank you so much. Putting the earring on, Gustav pinches her ear. Supposing your husband could see us now. Yes, what a wail there would be. He's very jealous then. Jealous? <laughs> I should say he is. Sounds from the adjacent room. Who has that room next door? I don't know. Well, tell me how you are getting along and what you are doing. Tell me how you are getting along. Trying to think how to answer, Tekla inadvertently uncovers the wax figure. <laughs> I say, whoever's that? By Jove, it's you! I don't think so. Well, it looks just like you. In your view... 
That reminds me of the story. How could your majesty see that? Tekla bursts out laughing. <laughs> You're impossible. Do you not know any new stories? No. But surely you should. Oh, I never heard anything so funny now. Is he prudish? Well, in speech he is. But not in... Other ways? He's not well just now. Gustav, poor dear. But little brother shouldn't go poking his nose into other people's wasp's nest. <laughs> Tekla, laughing. You're quite impossible. Do you remember once, when we were newly married, we stayed in this very room? Yeah. It was furnished differently then. There was a chest of drawers against that wall, and the bed was over there. <laughs> Stop it. Look at me. Well, that I can do. They gaze at one another. Do you think one can forget something that has made a very deep impression? No. Memories have tremendous power. Especially youthful ones. Do you remember when I first met you? You were a charming little girl, a small slate on which parents and governesses had made some scrawls which I had to wipe off. Then I wrote new texts to suit my own ideas, until you felt your slate was full. That's why, you see, I shouldn't like to be in your husband's place. But that's his business. It's also why I have so much pleasure in seeing you again. Our thoughts match so well. Sitting here talking with you is like opening bottles of old wine with my own tapping. Yes, I have my own wine again, but it has matured. And now that I have a fancy to marry again, I have purposely chosen a young girl who I can educate in my own way of thinking. The woman you see is a man's child, and if she is not, he becomes hers. And that makes a topsy-turvy world. You're going to marry again? Yes. I mean to tempt fortune once more, but... But this time I shall harness the mare better, so she won't bolt. Is she pretty? To me she is. But I may be too old. And curiously enough, now that chance has brought you and me together once more, I'm beginning to doubt if it's possible to play that game again. How do you mean? I feel that my roots are still in your soil, and the old wounds are opening up. You are a dangerous woman, Tekla. Oh, but my young husband says I shan't be able to make any more conquests. In other words, he no longer loves you. I don't understand what he means by love. You have played hide-and-seek so long that now you can't find each other. That's what happens. You've gone on playing the innocent until now he doesn't dare. Yes, you see, change has its disadvantages. It has its disadvantages. Is that a reproach? By no means. To a certain extent, whatever happens has to happen. If it didn't happen, something else would. This did happen, and there it is. What an enlightened man you are now. I have never met anyone with whom I so much liked exchanging ideas. You are so free from moralizing and preaching and making so few demands of people that one feels at ease in your company. You know, I'm jealous of your wife-to-be. You know, I'm jealous of your husband. And now we must part. Forever. Yes. We must part. But not without taking leave, huh? No. Gustav, following her. Yes. We must take leave of each other. Puts his arm round her. You have been dragged down by a sick soul who has infected you with his own disease. I will breathe new life into you. 
I will make your talent bloom again like an autumn rose. I will... Two ladies in traveling dresses come onto the veranda. Seeing the couple, they look surprised, point at them, laugh, and go off. Tekla, freeing herself. Who was that? Gustav, indifferently. Some visitors. Go away. I'm frightened of you. Why? You take away my soul and give you mine in exchange. Anyhow, you haven't got a soul. That's just an illusion. Now tell me. When and where? No, it wouldn't be fair to him. He really does still love me, and I don't want to do him any more harm. He doesn't love you. Do you want proof of it? How could you give me that? Gustav picks up the pieces of photograph from the floor. Here you are. See for yourself. Oh, this is scandalous. You see for yourself. So, when and where? The deceitful wretch. When? He's going tonight by the eight o'clock boat. Then, nine o'clock. Noises from the room are heard. Whoever can have taken that room and be making such a din? Let's see. Pierce through the keyhole. The table has been overturned and a water carafe smashed. That's all. Perhaps they have shut up a dog in there. Nine o'clock, then. Very well. He only has himself to blame. To think of him being so false when he's always preaching honesty and making me tell the truth. But wait a moment. How was it? He received me rather coldly. He didn't come down to the jetty, and then he said something about the youths on the boat, which I pretended not to take in. But how could he have known about them? Wait a minute. After that, he began philosophizing about women. And you seemed to be haunting him. And then he talked about becoming a sculptor and how sculptor was the art of today, just as you used to say once. No, really? No, really? Ah, now I understand. Now I begin to see what an absolute monster you are. You've been here stabbing him to death. It was you who had been sitting on the sofa. It was you who made him think he had epilepsy and must live as a celibate. And that he must show he was a man by taking a stand against his wife. Yes, it was you. How long have you been here? I've been here for a week. So it was you. It was you I saw on the boat. It was me. And then you thought you would trap me. I have done so. Not yet. Yes, you stole on my lamb like a wolf. You came here with a fiendish scheme to destroy my happiness, and you were carrying it out when my eyes were opened and I foiled it. It wasn't quite as you say. This is actually what happened. I admit I had a secret hope things would go wrong with you, but I was pretty certain no interference on my part would be needed. Besides, I was too much taken up with other things to have time for intriguing. Then when I happened to be away and at a loose end, I saw you on the boat with those young men, and I decided the time had come to have a look at you. I came here and your lamb immediately threw himself into the arms of the wolf. I won his sympathy through a kind of reflex action I won't be so discourteous to try and explain. At first I was sorry for him as he seemed to be in the same fix as I once was. But then he began to probe old wounds the book you know, and the idiot, and I was seized with the desire to pull him into pieces and mix the pieces up so thoroughly that he could never be put together again. And thanks to your conscientious groundwork, I succeeded. But I still had you to deal with. You were the mainspring of the works and had to be twisted to bits. What a buzz! When I came in here, I didn't really know if I was going to say anything. I had various schemes, but as in chess, my play depended on your moves. One thing led to another, chance helped, and so I had you ditched. Now you're caught. No. Yes, you are. The last thing you wanted has happened. The world, in the guise of two lady travelers whom I did not send for being no intriguer, the world has seen you reconcile with your former husband, creeping repentantly back into his faithful arms. Isn't that enough? It should be enough for your revenge. 
But tell me, you who are so enlightened and just... How can you, who think whatever happens has to happen, and we are not free to act... Not entirely free. It's the same thing. No. How can you, who hold me guiltless since I was driven by my nature and the circumstances to behave as I did, how can you believe you have any cause for revenge? For that very reason. Because my nature and the circumstances drove me to seek revenge. Which makes it quits, doesn't it? But do you know why you two were bound to get the worst of it in this fight? Tekla looks scornful. And why you let yourselves be tricked? Because I'm stronger than you and wiser too. It's you who have been the idiot. And so has he. And now you can see that one isn't necessarily an idiot because one doesn't write novels or paint pictures. Bear that in mind. Have you no feelings at all? None. That's why I can think you know, a process of which you have little experience, and act as you have so recently discovered. All this merely because I wounded your vanity? There's no merely about that. You'd better stop wounding people's vanity. It's their most vulnerable you spot. Addictive creature, shame on you! You wanton creature, shame on you! It's my nature, isn't it? It's my nature, isn't it? One should learn something of human nature in general before giving one's own nature free reign. Otherwise one may get hurt, and then what a wailing and gnashing of teeth. Can't you ever forgive? Yes, I have forgiven you. <laughs> have you? Certainly. Have I lifted a finger against you in all these years? No. And now I only came here to have a look at you. And then you went to pieces. I played a bit of a joke on your spouse, and that was enough to burst his bubble. And now here I am, the plaintiff defending myself. Tekla, have you nothing to reproach yourself with? Nothing at all. Christians say our actions are ruled by providence, and others call it fate. So we're guiltless, aren't we? Up to a point, yes. But there's always a place where the guilt creeps in and the creditors present themselves sooner or later. Guiltless but responsible. Guiltless before him who no longer exists. Responsible to oneself and one's fellow creatures. So you came here to dun me. I came here to recover what you had stolen, not what you had had as a gift. You stole my honor and I could only regain it by taking yours. Wasn't that my right? <laughs> Honor. <sighs> well, are you satisfied now? Yes, I am satisfied. Rings the bell. And now you're going home to your fiancé. I have no fiancé. And I shall never have one. And I am not going home, for I have no home, nor do I want one. A waiter enters. Will you bring up my bill, please? I'm leaving by the eight o'clock boat. The waiter bows and goes out. Without atonement? Atonement? You use so many words that have lost their meaning. Atonement? Are we perhaps all three to live together? It's you who should do the atoning. By making good my losses, but you can't. You did nothing but take, and what you took you have devoured, so you can't return it. Will it satisfy you if I say, Forgive me for your having clawed my heart to pieces. Forgive me for your having disgraced me. Forgive me for having been the daily laughing stock of my pupils for seven years. Forgive me for setting you free from the domination of your parents, for releasing you from the tyranny of ignorance and superstition, for setting you over my house, for giving you friends and a position, for making a woman of the mere child you were. Forgive me, as I forgive you. So 
so I have cancelled my note of hand. Now go and settle your account with the other one. What have you done with him? I'm beginning to suspect something terrible. Done with him? Why? Do you love him? Yes. Just now it was me. Was that true? It was true. Do you know what you are, then? You despise me. I pity you. It's a trait, I don't say a fault, but a trait which has a disastrous consequence. Poor Tekla. Do you know I feel almost remorseful? Although I am as free from guilt as... As you are. But perhaps you will enjoy knowing just how I felt that time. Do you know where your husband is? I think I know I do know. He is in that room there. He has heard everything and seen everything, and he, he who sees his familiar spirit dies. Adolf appears in the veranda doorway. He is white as a corpse. There is a bleeding scratch on one cheek. His eyes are staring without expression, and he is frothing at the mouth. Gustav backing. <laughs> well, there he is. Settle up with him now, and see if he is as generous as I have been. Goodbye. Gustav goes towards the other room and stops. Tekla runs to Adolf with arms outstretched. Adolf! Adolf leans against the veranda door and collapses on the floor. Tekla throws herself across his body, caressing him. Adolf! Adolf, my darling child, are you still alive? Oh, speak! Speak! Forgive your wicked Tekla, forgive, forgive, forgive. You must answer me, my little brother. Can you hear? No. Oh my god, he doesn't hear. He's dead. Oh god in heaven, oh god, help us, help us! God, help us. She really does love him, too. Poor creature. Curtain. And that is the end of Creditors, a play by August Strindberg, written in 1888. I hope to continue on doing Strindberg for this particular portion of this season. I have at least two books of his, so I should hopefully not run out of content. If you have any plays of your own that you would like to send in to have be read, you can always email me at bemuseartsinc at gmail.com. That's B-E-M-U-S-E-A-R-T-S-I-N-C at gmail.com. Anyways, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day, and I hope to have you back in Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner. Thank you. <laughs>